Welcome to Pink Radio with Prestige. This is the place for you, the diva boss entrepreneur who needs quick tips on building your crave worthy brand. This is your host, Nicole Doss, CEO of the Prestige Society, a membership organization for women entrepreneurs who believe in building powerful networks while slanging in their industries. So I want you to go ahead and grab your favorite cup of coffee and get your favorite tips right here with Prestige. Hey, 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 everyone. Welcome back to another episode of Pink Radio with Prestige. Today, I am so excited to have one out of a two-part awesome super duo girl boss team. And you know what? Like normal, I'm not going to give away who they are. I want them to be able to introduce themselves to you. So, or the one person out of the two to you. So go ahead and tell us who you are and what do you do? So hi, Pink Radio listeners. Um, I am one half of Nasha Dish. My name is Kiana, also known as Yanni. Uh, my partner, who is Kendra, was not able to be with us today. So let's just give her a big hi. Um, she's actually <laughs> in class today. So, um, But yes, yeah, so we have a nonprofit entitled Nasha Dish, and it's geared towards supporting and empowering women of color who are non-traditional students and or adult learners. I love it. So what encouraged you to start non tradish So Kendra and I, who, is, who you'll hear a little bit more about, um, is my youngest sister. Um, and so we both are considered non-traditional students. Um, and so in my quest to kind of feel more supported on campus, uh, myself and a co- couple of other students, uh, we created several organizations on campus geared towards um, non-traditional students. And so I wanted to create something on a more larger platform um, that we can just impact not one group of students on one campus, but to kind of spread out amongst campuses um, in Pennsylvania and obviously now uh, more institutions outside of the state. And so I had this idea uh, one night in December and I literally jumped out of the bed and I called Kendra and I said, oh my God, I got it. And literally Nasha Dish was born December 2018. Uh, We actually just launched um, in May. Um, And so this is our baby and we are really, you know, moving forward with this and impacting a lot of the women who want to go back to school or who are already in school that need the additional support. Right, right. And I love that you saw the opportunity through your own personal experience. I think that Mm -hmm. really helps tie it, make it something very personal to female founders who go through something and say, you know, hey, you know, I went through this experience. I identify that there's a gap. I want to be able to create something to fill the void. So I really love that you were able to do that. And I love how you get those little God winks at night. So you were able to get that kind of encouragement in the middle of the night, wake up and say, this is it. And you didn't sit on it. You know, like you got up, you shared it with someone who you can trust with your idea, and then you were able to move forward. So I think that is beyond amazing. Thank you. (laughs) You're welcome. So tell me, what would you say is a major gap that your company helps to bridge for students who use your service? So one of the things we really hone our services on is empowering students. So a lot of the people we run into don't even think that there's an opportunity for them to even try to go back to school, whether it be financial, whether it be uh, family life, so many different um, elements that go into um, trying to even think about going back to school. And so we definitely empower um, and assist our clients to basically advocate for themselves, right? Because if you don't believe in you, nobody else is going to believe in you. So that's the first thing that we do. Um, The second gap that I think we fill um, is allowing um, basically all of the non-traditional students um, as well as the adult learners who do use our program, they're basically being able to go on campus and advocate for themselves and their needs on campus. And so we basically had one student who um, ran out of financial aid. There were some financial issues going on. And so uh, one of the things we did was we talked about um, the school that she was attending, their emergency funding. And so she had no idea about this. Um, and the school, of course, is not going to tell you about emergency funding. Um, mm-hmm. But they, it was a larger institution, and so they had access to funds. And so we were able to get her those additional funds so that she could finish throughout this year. And so she is graduating in May, and we are so excited about that. Um, but we helped her. We assisted her with that. And so we're just in 
empowering students. When we learn something, we make sure that those who have access to us know as well. And so it's all about really knowledge and, and gaining that knowledge and sharing it with other non-traditional students who are women of color. Absolutely. And I love that. I, I love when you're able to take nuggets that you've learned and now instead mm-hmm. of harnessing it for yourself, you're going to share that with others so that they are empowered and they're able to make differences in, in their lives and they're empowered yep. to be able to move forward. And that that's beautiful because I don't think we have enough conversations about opportunities, options, resources that are out there. And I always right. say we make decisions based on information that is laid in front of us. So if if you right. are lacking in information, then you are mm-hmm. going to make very poor decisions because you don't have the intel to be able to make different decisions. You know, we, we call it and, business, business intelligence, but in this case, this is just everyday intel that you would need to know to help you in this space. Absolutely. And I think one of the biggest things for us at Non-Tradish, we also offer mentoring, right? Mentorship opportunities. And so mm-hmm. when we see a gap with a student who um, maybe doesn't have access to that information, we take that time with them and work with them and say, hey, listen, these are some of the options that you have. Let's weigh the options together, right? So creating that sisterhood. And we're not just talking about servicing folks. We're not just giving information. We're walking you through the process. So if it's FAFSA that you need this additional assistance with, if it's choosing the right courses, right? If it's choosing a, um, even a major, right? Because a lot of people say, I want to go back to school. They just don't know what they want to go to school for. So right. we help them with that. And it's not just um, higher education. We also assist in if you want to do a specific trade. So if you want to go to cosmetology school, if you want to go to HVAC school, we have those um, things available so that we can say, here are the resources, here's the application, let's walk you through it. And so that is really what we're building our organization on, um, actual sisterhood, not just being about it, but talking about it and walking with our sisters. Well, you know, I like that all day long because that's exactly <laughs> what we do at Prestige. So I love it. And what I love about it is that for me, I am very passionate about um, giving women the resources, but also walking right. through what the experience is. So. Mm-hmm. You know, I love, honestly, you just like made my heart sing with that um, because I just recently walked someone through um, publishing their book. And oh, that's amazing. Like to the point where I was like, just put me on a Zoom. Let's just go ahead. I will walk you through KDP um, because I, I, you know, I have multiple uh, published books. So my thing is, if I've done this experience more than one time, mm-hmm. I can help you mm-hmm. through it. Let's walk through it. Absolutely. And Let's like, walk through it. Yep. Yes. And like multiple days of us just out on a Zoom walking through the process. And um, right. it just, it warms my heart when I can see now that she's a published author, the people who hold her book, how her story has helped women go through uh, tragedy and loss and grief. And mm-hmm. I'm just like, mm-hmm. wow, like, it's not even about the fact that I helped her walk through it. It's mm-hmm. the fact that you were, she was able to experience success, period. Right. And let me say this, it changes when you help somebody else reach a certain point in their life where they are now able to do it on their own and then help somebody else. Our idea of community changes, right? So it's like, it's no longer just about me, right? Like Mm -hmm. I can get here, but that idea of like, listen, as you climb is super important to the benefit, especially in the black community, right? Mm -hmm. And I'm sure as well as in the Latina community, right? Mm -hmm. That idea of being able to help one another. When I get to the top of the ladder, I need to be able to look back down and say, listen, these are all the things I did. And it's not even about payment, right? Because you're going to get paid. That, that payment is going to come, especially when it's your calling, it's going to come to you. But we got to start building this idea of like community of listen as we climb and really meaning that, right? So as I'm moving up the mountain, I may not have all the resources, but whatever I do have, I'm willing to go back down and share that. And then my sisters above me can kind of share with me and we can just all trek up together. I think that's the biggest thing for Nasher Dish is really about building that idea of community. Absolutely. I just, as you're speaking, I'm like, if you don't get out of my head, <laughs> oh, sorry. What you say, if you anchor your, your purpose or your brand or your business to your purpose, mm-hmm. so anchoring mm-hmm. your brand, or your business to your purpose, and you place your tribe in front of you and you help them, the blessings are going to come. 
monetary blessings, health, wealth, all all those blessings that they're going to come, but you can't say this is the fruit of my, my labor. And all you're concerned about is what you get out of this because trees that bear fruit do not bear them for themselves. And I think that's important because we are glamorizing this whole movement of becoming a female founder into securing the bag to get things, to make yourself feel puffed up. And I think the right to move, Move from that and realize that no, God placed in your spirit this gift so you can help others move forward. So be that blessing and really not lose in your tribe and move them forward. So when I tell you, you were just in my whole head with that, <laughs> that uh, you definitely were. So I, I, I love it. I love it. So tell me, you know, this is a fairly new business, but really mm-hmm. well thought. Um, you know, looked at your website, professionally done. Um, you already have, um, you know, people that you've been able to help. Um, I'm mm-hmm. sure there's partnerships that you've been able to create. Tell yep. me, a lot of our listeners are female founders who are in various phases in their, their entrepreneurial journey. So, so tell me, what are some of the biggest challenges you have faced in building your organization? So one of the things we, we've kind of been struggling with is finding, um, I, I would like to call them sponsors um, and community partners, right, that really want to basically get down and do the groundwork with us. Mm-hmm. Um, and so a lot of the things we've been doing has been coming from our own pockets, right? And so um, I was just reading an article yesterday um, about a young lady who was starting a um, foundation um, in Philadelphia. And she basically was saying, you know, I wasn't able to get up off the ground and run it in Philadelphia because there weren't a lot of opportunities for financing. And so she moved her business. Um, to Atlanta, and she is now booming. And I, I, I get it, and I understand it. But I know that Nasha, this is a place that that Philadelphia needs, right? And so that concept of like getting up and moving on, moving with the business is great. But I'm homegrown, right? I'm I'm Philly all day, and so I know that there is a place for me here. And so what we're really trying to do is kind of find that financial backing that we need to continue to help because all of our services are free. Right. You have there's nothing that you're paying for, right? Right. And we don't foresee um, folks having to come and pay for these services, but we would like to put on programs and do different things. And so that financial backing is something that, that is really challenging. Um, but I like to think that because it's my passion, because it was God sent and it was none of me that God will deliver. He will be able to provide and allow us to do what we need to do and it will come. Um, but the financial backing has definitely been, um, Sort of, sort of a challenge because we've been able to do things thus far. Yeah. I think one last challenge I think for me has been um, so recently we've been reaching out to different um, schools and community organizations and you know saying hey can we come do a free workshop for you all just to let you know what non is about um, is geared towards women of color and they're like oh it's only for women of color. And I'm like, okay, this is going to be an uphill battle because I can only speak from my lens and my perspective, right? Right. Um, And I know that uh, it's very challenging, particularly for women of color who are raising a family, who, you know, working two to three jobs, um, to try to even think about going back to school. And so what we like to say in our tradition is black women are taking care of everybody who is taking care of them. And so that's what Natra just wants to do. And it's not just the women who are older adults. It's some of the young ones who have children, some of the young ones who are faced with different challenges and can or cannot, you know, get back into education for whatever the reason is. And we want to be able to showcase that. And folks, some folks have been perceptive to that. And so that's, I think, twofold of what kind of what we're, what we're dealing with. Right. And, you know, the, the good thing is, is that there are auxiliary groups in um, institution, collegiate institutions that mm-hmm. would love to partner with you. I think the thing is, is that there are some mainstream programs who may not have the same lens or uh, mission and vision or objective right. that would align with what you, you have in store. But I definitely believe mm-hmm. that, um, especially in New Jersey, There's like EOF programs, which um, stands for Equal Opportunity Funding Programs. And it's not, you know, it's for minority based, but it's also for those Mm -hmm. who come from a certain socioeconomic background. So just because you're Caucasian doesn't mean that you can't get into EOF. It's based off of your socioeconomics. But unfortunately, because of the way, you know, 
this system is built, a lot of the socioeconomic uh, folks that fall under a certain uh, salary line, um, they end up looking a lot like you and you know you and I, as well as our, Absolutely. you know Latina brothers and sisters. And so, um, you know, when you you partner with those kind of individuals or those groups, you have a better chance at being able to open the doors. Whereas right. when you have this conversation, um, because a lot of people are very affected ended right now by the whole discussion around white privilege. Uh, Chelsea mm-hmm. Handler just did mm-hmm. like a Netflix, um, and, and not to take it to this area, but... No, it's okay. Chelsea it's okay. Handler we can go there. Did, we can go there. I love it. Right. So Chelsea Handler just did a documentary called um, Hello, White Privilege. It's me, Chelsea. And, um, you know, she's, you know, a, a Jewish woman who wants to talk about when she looks to the right and to the left of her, she at one point used to think that it was her talent that got her to where she is, but she's realizing that something's off and right. she's not seeing those who are of other nationalities or ethnicities who have mm-hmm. what she you know, believes that she brought to the table. She doesn't see them Mm -hmm. having the same experiences or opportunities as her. And Mm -hmm. she realizes that something's not, not right. And she wants to explore it. And it offends the crap out of both sides of the table. Uh, It Mm -hmm. offends those who are in minority communities who, and I won't even use the word minority because we're not the minority, but um, right. you know, it offends black and brown communities because they're like, why mm-hmm. are you asking us to solve a problem that was put on to us? It is your problem. And mm-hmm. it, it upsets, you know, those who are mainstream because their question is, well, why can't people just forget the past and keep on moving? We don't believe that there's a thing called privilege um, in, mm-hmm. our, in our area. And so you know, when you start saying, can we have a conversation about opening up opportunities for these individuals who look this way or have this economic space and they're not in that space, sometimes it's really hard for them to be open to the conversation. So I would, you know, kudos to you for even reaching out to groups because partnerships is definitely going to be the key for you. Um, right. Also, you know, um, let's talk because I want to be able to get you into doors and to, I mean, cause that's what it really is all about, right? Leveraging your network and being right. able to right. leverage those relationships. Because I, when I tell you, I get absolutely excited. Like I was excited <laughs> to sit with you and talk. I know. Like, oh, girl, <laughs> let's talk. Like, because this is the, this is where we need help um, mm-hmm. and there, in, in two places. Well, one place I definitely think in education, whether it's vocational or formal. And that's been a debate Absolutely. way back with, you know, um, forever. <laughs> right, right. Well, so, so the one thing about what I love about what I can bring to this is that I have um, uh, education in, in terms of collegiate education, but then I also have the trade school. So I did go to college dermatology school. I did graduate. And so I understand from both sides what works best for some people, right? Because for seven to eight years, I was a hairstylist, right? Mm -hmm. Before I decided to go back to school um, and and do a career change. And so I can see both sides of the fences and I'm very well versed on both sides. So I totally get it and I understand. And that was part of um, kind of something that, you know, myself and my board, we talked about, you know, do we want this to just be for folks who are pursuing a college degree? And in the beginning, everybody was for it. And then I decided, I said, no, because what about the person that's trying to get their GED? What about the person that doesn't know that a college education is attainable, right? Like, what about those people? Where, are those, where will they fit in? And so I really wanted to create something, and I know Kendra wanted to create something that we knew would be long-lasting and, and could support those folks who are getting their GEDs, folks who are considered non-traditional students, folks who are adult learners, but with particular emphasis on women of color. And so that's the, that's, that's where we were coming from. And that, that has, that is, and will always be the game plan for us um, because it's so important that we, that we have that backing, whether it be vocational or um, in terms of collegiate education. So that's, that's particularly important for me. I always try to figure out where I fit in, Right. And let me tell you, when I had that idea and, and, you know, speaking with Kendra and she was like, Kiana, you, this is it. And we've been running with it and it's been working. <laughs> I'm like, okay, God, I see you. 
I just a God idea. <laughs> I love it. Well, and, and that's the thing. I think that those two really special areas are around education, whether it's formal or informal, vocational mm-hmm. or collegiate. But I also think mm-hmm. that the second piece is a very important piece you talked about, which is funding. You know, black and brown yeah. female founders only get about 0.001% of VC funding. Um, and that is a devastating number. First of all, I would have been yep. devastated if I saw the just one percent. But then when yep. I saw point zero, I was like, okay, point zero one is horrible. But when I saw point zero 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 one, I was like, mm-hmm. you guys, like that's almost a joke. Like what's yep. happening? And I think that yep. those are really important, two important factors that I think are really um that impact women, period. So whether they're yep. women who want to create their own corporate ladder and they're looking for funding versus if they're women who want to climb the corporate ladder but can't only get so far because of educational constraints, I think that Absolutely. are um, both areas that are really important. So I thank you for sharing those challenges, but I got to tell you the truth. I think that those challenges are something that you will overcome very soon. Mm-hmm. Um, because, you know, too, I love that you said, this is homegrown. Like I'm here. Right. This is, this is where I'm building. And I think that there are opportunities for you to be able to do some campaigning and some funding around this very, I want to say mm-hmm. this very important organization. So I think that although these are maybe some of your biggest challenges now, I don't think that they will be your challenges for long. Right. Absolutely. I agree. So can no you more tell sis. Go oh, ahead and speak it, sis. Yes, yes, absolutely. So let's, you know, I know we talk challenges. I know. But, you know, with every challenge, there's definitely a silver lining. And I'm sure with what you and your sister have been working towards, um, you have definitely experienced some really awesome moments. So how about you share for our listeners, you know, what has been some of the most rewarding experiences you've had so far with building non tradish so the first one would be um, we started uh, maybe a couple months back our um, non-tradish WCW, right? And so mm-hmm. basically what that is, shining a light on women of color who are currently and or just graduated from their um, respective programs. And so uh, we actually yesterday, someone just wrote to us and they said, you know, I really love your page. I would like to nominate my cousin or my friend. Um, and one of the things that we thought about when we're doing the non-tradish WCW was basically highlighting women of all different races so that folks can see like, hey, listen, it's not just me. I'm not by myself. Right. Um, and so one young lady we highlighted, um, she had already had her four-year degree, and now she's going back to school um, to be a funeral director, right? So, wow. like, that was amazing. And then we have one young lady who um, her mother passed away when she was really young, and she just became an RN. And she has, you know, she's a single mother raising her daughter, and she's doing amazing things. And so the fact that we get an opportunity to shed a light on these women um, so that other people can see that, it's, that you are not alone, that you can do it, that's been something that's been really, really rewarding. Um, and not just for myself, but I think for other women in the community who may feel like, you know, I may or may not be doing enough. And when you see people's story, um, you're like, wow, I, I, you know, I, I actually am doing something. And so it's not minimizing the work that you're doing. It's helping you build on what you've been doing. And so that's, that's been really, really rewarding. I think another thing that's been really rewarding for us is how Kendra and I have grown, um, not just in terms of the business, but how we have grown, you know, to be in this position to be able to to help someone else, right? And so it's like, okay, well, I've never had a mentor before, right? I had to ask people to be my mentors, right? Nobody ever came and said, hey, here's an opportunity, let's take it. No, it was hey, I see something that, you know, I think that I want to aspire to. Do you think you could be my mentor? Some of those opportunities did not work out the way that I thought it would be. And so now being on the flip side of being, you know, mentoring other folks, I'm like, wow, this is this is what it's like to be able to give back in a way that I didn't think that I could. And as well as Kendra, she's been mentoring folks. And so she's very the reserved, quiet one. Mm-hmm. Um, but she has been out here, you know, 
she she shining in the light. That's all I can say. Sis is like mm-hmm. turning into someone that I don't even recognize, but it's, it's an amazing process to go through with one another. And the fact that she's not just my sister, that she's my business partner, it makes it that much easier. And, and we can really respect where God has taken us. Because uh, right. literally, started from the bottom, now we hear like, that's really us. So it's so great to come out on the other side and be like, wow, not only did we create something for other women to respect and for other women to get supportive service, is from, but now for our children's children, right? Their idea of legacy, they have something to aspire to. So whether it's um, collegiate education or trade school, you can do either or. And if you want to be an entrepreneur, we have an avenue for that as well. So that's that's been really amazing. I love it. I love it. All right. So, and I'm sorry, because of course, you know, outside of my little studio, someone's like a trying to move trash. And I'm like, why would you roll your trash can next to that? <laughs> no, I, I can't apologize. even hear anything. <laughs> okay, good, 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 good. So um, let's see. Oh, so I love everything that you just said. And I love to see too, when you're able to identify growth in when you're mm-hmm. building this too. So, so great reward oper- um, examples of, of rewards you've seen, as well as really awesome sharing and how you guys have grown in that space as well. So, but because a lot, like I said before, a lot of our listeners are uh, either aspiring female founders or female founders who are currently uh, working their their business, and we have some women who are in the nonprofit realm. What mm-hmm. would you say, or how do you currently go about fundraising? Because you know we talked about how that is creating income, or not income, but like getting funds and and to help you with operation costs, helping you to right. scale up, helping you with programs, finding sponsors, right. but finding all of that is quite difficult. What do you currently do to kind of help in that space? So one of the big things that Kendra and I did when we first started, uh, we kind of mapped out our network. So, right. So not only, you know, do I have um, different networks within my, you know, my, in my family network, but so does Kendra. And so we really just honed in on our networks and we're, we, you know, we sat down with a group of folks and we said, Hey, listen, this is what we're doing. Do you think that this is something that you would want to support? And so that's how we garnered our initial supporters, right. To be able to even start up doing everything we're doing. Um, we're currently in the process of getting our 501c3 status, so we're actually waiting for that. Um, but one of the things that I found just kind of challenging is that when we're trying to do fundraisers, folks want to know that you have your 501c3. And if you don't have it, they want to know how are they being compensated or and or how can they be in some sort of partnership with you. So if that means, you know, putting their flyer up on your Instagram or putting their flyer up on your Facebook, you know, so many different things that people um, in terms of fundraising want to know, right? And so right. the main thing that I would suggest Start with your network, right? So that's you, mom, dad, or, you know, whatever your family dynamic looks like. Start there and then go outward. And so that's pretty much how we were able to to kind of start it up. Um, and now we are actually having our first fundraising event, October 12th. And basically what that's going to do is twofold. So it's our soft launch and our fundraising. And so what we're doing is talking about the impact that we've been making thus far, where we see ourselves um, in a couple of years, and what we plan on doing with the funds that we're raising. And so within that, we give people an opportunity to say, hey, that seems like something I want to I want to support, or you know what? That's not something I want to support long-term. Maybe this one-time thing is good. So giving those people options in terms of that, Um, but really honing in on your network um, and and just trying to get people to kind of buy into what you're doing and why it's needed and why it's necessary, right? So making sure that we all talk to potential monetarily or uh, supports me as far as helping out. Um, Mm -hmm. And I always ask like, well, what what do they think they're supporting? And That's a, lot a great of times, question. Right. And I think a lot of times we don't fully explain what we do and so mm-hmm. or what we're trying to do or, you know, just let's just have a real moment. If you are a mm-hmm. scattered brain in your personal life and then all of a sudden you coming out with a quote unquote new business idea um, mm-hmm. you offer people services just because they're in Detroit or because they're in New York City or just because they're in Miami and you have the heart of a researcher and you seem so tenacious that I don't see you saying, well, 
when you're in Miami and you want to go to University of Miami, and I don't really know, so I'm going to say no. Right. I don't see you doing right. that. So right, right, I really right. do see you being able to help people all over. I see your flagship office being in Philadelphia for sure, but I see you having satellite offices wherever the need is. So I, I definitely I see that. Right. So I don't, I don't think that that's something that seems like big. I feel like that's right. on the right trajectory of where you're going. So I'm like mm-hmm. super excited for, for that vision and for um, that space. And I love that you even talked about the children piece of it. So uh, I went back to school for my master's, uh, I want to say 2010 through 2012. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So I, I didn't have a problem um, managing being a wife and the kids, well, the kid at the time, the one kid, um, because my <laughs> wife is a little bit older, right? So like if right. mommy's studying, go in your room, you do your homework too. And you let me right. be and everything's fine. I already struggle in being a domesticated wife. So if I'm not cooking today, nobody's shocked. Cause I don't normally cook. Right. So, so nothing really was a problem with me being right. a student because I've always been that person that, you know, worked and went to school and whatever. So it wasn't that problem at home, but I also know Mm -hmm. that that's not everyone's reality. And there are some family constructs where there's little ones, there's tiny kids and and nothing. I tried to go to school when my daughter was two and I, she was two and I traveled a lot for my job and my mom was a teacher. So she'd be off for the summer times. And I remember my mom would travel with me and be like the nanny And I remember like, Mm -hmm. I was probably in my mid twenties at the time. And I would like, you know, let my mom watch my daughter during, you know, during the time and I would, but then I would try to come back to the hotel room. And I remember struggling with math, which is like my worst subject. And I remember struggling and I was like, mom, like, I can't do this. And I was unsuccessful. Um, And that was when I was, you know, the first time I tried to go back to grad school. So I was really unsuccessful because I couldn't handle that stress Mm -hmm. of having a little Mm -hmm. one. But once she got older, I was able to do it. Um, But I know, like you said, some people have really young kids. I know that some people are expected, depending on their culture, depending on how they were raised, they are expected to cook five nights a week or they're expected to do certain things to the household where um, there's no support there. And I ran into it recently. I spoke at an event. And we were talking about things we really want to tackle in our lives and, and where are we telling ourselves that we're not enough or where mm-hmm. are we telling ourselves that we can't really, you know, um, conquer these things. And this one woman was like, right. I tell myself that with school and she was in a graduate program and she was like, maybe this time I'll be able to really like do the work. And I was mm-hmm. just like, well, what's, what's the problem? And she's like, well, I have kids. And I was just like, I don't get it. Like you got kids in what? But I realized mm-hmm. like sometimes that's really a distraction. So when you were talking about even involving kids in the piece of it, it was like, I need 